SUNY, SUNY Press, you know, I, all, the, all, the, all the companies and the university presses that I researched for my proposal. And then I realized that it was possible to, to do it. For I am being a, a scholar, being an academic myself, I had the contacts with people who are the producers of content. And in, in current times, that is what makes the difference. Anyone can publish a book. The problem is producing great content, finding great, great content. And, um, the first uh, author that uh, gave me a hand was Jose Balsa. And Jose Balsa was generous enough to let me publish his book. And with Balsa, we got you know, many things. Uh, two months after Balsa uh, published his book, uh, Vargas Llosa mentioned him in the uh, Cátedra Vargas Llosa in Madrid. And somehow, I, I got a, a, a huge line of authors trying to get published in Articultica Press, thanks to this publicity. And we've been uh, uh, doing so. Mm. But at some point, I realized that I was concentrating too much in my passion. My passion is poetry, and obviously short stories and narrative. And the whole idea at the very beginning was to develop a university press, if you remember, in my first minute. That's what I said. <laughs> so um, I ended up realizing that I needed to open an imprint devoted for uh, uh, books that had um, an academic uh, style and uh, an, uh, an academic audience. And that's why we developed uh, Estebana Books. Estebana Books, uh, although we uh, only have two books in, in, uh, in the market, which, uh, the first one is La Resistencia al Ideal by Tony Montesinos, who happens to be the literary critic of La Razón in Spain. Um, uh, Estebana Books has, uh, right now has five titles on the contract. Uh, and the, the, the next one is uh, Women's in the Early Modern Spain and uh, the Americas, and it's coming. Uh, it's coming out in uh, October, and we will publish. We will uh, launch it in uh, Florida International University next 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 spring. Um, so the first one was this collection of essays by Tony Montesinos, and then I had already other contracts that I am friends with Araceli, and uh, uh, she told me about this project, and it was like like Cham would say a ready made. Why? Because there you had an editor who has a, a trajectory who's willing to open and to share the space to new emerging writers who happen to be doctoral candidates at the Graduate Center. And that's why I embrace Orientalism. And I have to say, I was telling them that the book, although we, this is the very first event that we organized, the book is selling in Amazon. And Barnes and Noble, they received the reports once in a while. Hopefully, at some point, we will get the libraries to, to purchase it. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, the the reason for, for me to, uh, to have included Tony So The other thing that I really liked about the project was the fact that it was in English. For we need to do the crossover. We need to be multilingual. And Arte Poetica Press is, is, uh, has, uh, out of the other five books that we have in contract, three of them are in English. There is one that is, that has, is multilingual, and the other two are in Spanish. So what you see is the very beginning of a, of a larger project, as I was telling. Um, um, the members of the panel today, I am uh, always looking for new proposals. So if any of you has a proposal, you know, I'd, I'd be more than happy to discuss it. I'll be totally honest and transparent. For this is the key. When I did the research for Arte Poetica for the, for the uh, university press, I realized that the key to keep the publishing system transparent was to transfer the blind revision policy that we have in, in, the, in, the, in the journals to the publishing system. So that's what I do. Regardless of who sends me the, 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 a proposal, what I do is that I look for a couple of peer reviewers, actually three, and if I get two uh, recommendations for publications, then I offer the, the author a contract. So by moving, by applying this technique, this blind submission policy to the publishing of new books, I have been successful at bringing uh, a high quality material into the market. Now, are, are we, do we make any money? No, that's not the point. <laughs> that is not the point. But we are uh, in the capacity to keep offering uh, uh, more contracts to more, more authors, and we keep publishing uh, books. And now for my last 30 seconds, I realize. Uh, you have plenty of time. Oh, I do? OK. Yeah, right. I want to say two minutes. OK. Maybe three. For my, for my last two minutes, let me go back to what I do for a living, which is I, 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 I work at the Center for Worker Education, which is the Division of Interdisciplinary Studies, 
at City College with uh, someone who's very familiar to the Graduate Center, which is Professor Juan Carlos Mercado. But Professor Mercado, who's in my team, came with this idea of organizing a, poet, uh, sorry, a film festival in about the Americas, because we have a master's degree in the study of the Americas. I happen to be the new director of the, the study of the Americas uh, master's degree. That's another quote. That's another story. I am here to invite you to come to the festival. Okay, the festival runs from uh, June 2nd to June 5th. We have uh, celebrities coming uh, to attend the, the show. Uh, the opening night is going to be with Mercedes Sosa, the voice of Latin America at the Instituto Cervantes. And the, uh, the closing night will be with Winter in the Blood. We have a short film competition with more than 65 submissions from all over the Americas. Uh, we have awards. The greatest thing is that all the events are free and open to the public. And the opening and the closing night ceremonies, they have something even better. Free food, <laughs> which is my favorite kind of food, right? Um, so, you know, this is a, uh, I really like to take this opportunity to invite you to attend the film festival. And uh, that's, a, that's a great way to start the summer, OK? Uh, again, I like to go back to uh, Orientalism and thank Professor Tinajero for uh, trusting my publishing house, for believing in my project, and for uh, supporting their students, which is, from my perspective, the, the biggest gesture of generosity a professor can have with a student. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for being spot on. So I was uh, over eager to introduce her first, and um, so I'm happy to introduce Araceli Tinajero. Now she's a professor of Spanish at the Graduate Center and City College of uh, New York, also part of CUNY. Um, among her recent publications, let me just mention two here. Um, one of them is uh, Elector de Tabaqueria, which sounds quite uh, enticing in English. Um, Elector, a history of the cigar factory reader. Um, uh, she's also the editor, of course, of uh, the volume we are talking about today, Orientalisms of the Hispanic and Luso-Brazilian World. Um, you all have a little leaflet in which you can probably see her other publications as well. So without further ado, I would like to ask you for Thank your you. comments. Thank you. and thank you for coming uh, today. Uh, I would like to thank the Wilner Center for hosting this event. Uh, over the last two decades, uh, Professor Mauricio Font, the director of the center, has been very supportive. Um, thanks to him, we have been able to organize several events and seminars in our persistent effort to promote Latin American and transoceanic studies and scholarship. Uh, I would like to also like to uh, thank all research assistants uh, without the rigorous work, uh, these kinds of events will not take place. Thank you, Jonathan Aguirre in the back, and Rosalina Lopez, who's outside, uh, uh, welcoming uh, uh, the public. Uh, why? Uh, and also, I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Professor uh, Anna Akasoy. I was so lucky to find you, and I was so lucky that you accepted uh, uh, to come here uh, and to be the moderator and also the discussant. Um, so um, thank you so much. I just would like to briefly mention that uh, she's the author of, uh, 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 this is in German. <laughs> you don't have to read the German. Okay, uh, okay. and uh, she's the co-editor of Renaissance, Agrarism and its Aftermath, Arabic Philosophy in Early Modern Europe, and agent and mediator cultural exchanges in Ilkhanit, Iran. Thank you so much for that. Sure, yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, appreciate that. All right, so why the title? Why Orientalisms and not Orientalism, as uh, Edward Said's uh, uh, first uh, work, uh, which was published back in 1978? Well, there are several uh, Orientalisms, <laughs> and uh, for instance, just to be very brief, um, when we talk about the um, the, um, the Iberian Peninsula, 
um, we had the, um, the Arab uh, dynasties uh, there from 1711 to 1492. And also when we talk, uh, when we, uh, talk about um, uh, Portugal here, uh, we have, for instance, this, uh, the epic uh, poem of, uh, of Portugal, Os Luciadas, uh, uh, also talk about the travels uh, to the east, uh, to the east, to the, to the far east. And in the case of Latin America, we have, uh, through the Spanish Empire, we had the Manila Galleon, which was the, uh, um, an exchange of goods um, that traveled from the Far East, from the Philippines, to Acapulco, Mexico. This uh, exchange uh, took place for almost 300 years. So there are several Orientalisms when we want to talk about uh, the presence of uh, either the, the Far East in Latin America or Orientalism from the point of view of the Portuguese or the uh, for Portuguese or the Brazilian world. So um, the most recent critical studies reflect the themes of the emerging literature or new approaches to approaches to rereading classical text. For instance, uh, a recent studies focus on race and ethnicity. Uh, Asian and Middle Eastern immigration in Spain and Latin America, tourism, Asian aesthetics and artifacts, Asian cultural consumption in Hispanic lit uh, cultures, the process of assimilation within the Asian communities that em emigrated to Europe or Latin America, how the Asian continent presents itself in the view of Latin American travelers, the way in which the Oriental subject represents itself in art and literature, what kind of relationship exists, exists between Asian communities and other minority groups in a specific country? What are the assimilation policies, the representation of Asian women and Arabs, both in Eastern texts as well as Western ones? Transnationalism and the style of Asians and Arabs, etc. The um, list is infinite. So I'm going to show you briefly the chapters of the book. Um, so um, part one is, has a loose of Brazilian Orientalisms. And then the, we go to Spanish Middle Eastern Orientalisms. And part three is Trans-Pacific Orientalisms. So it is a chronological um, a, and trans-oceanic um, collection. Uh, because we began with uh, the chronicles of the Portuguese in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And then we finish with Cristina Rivera Garza's Verde Shanghai, which was published in 2011? 2010. 2010. So, so, so I just wanted to connect um, the Spanish uh, speaking role with the Portuguese speaking role. Because very few scholars do that. Uh, they don't connect, they don't make those connections. And uh, so I wanted to be more open minded about this. So, um, uh, the first chapter, in the first chapter, pa Paolo uh, Franchetti, by the way, he's the ed editor of the University of Campinas, uh, uh, of the University of Campinas. He's an Orientalist himself, and he was generous enough to, uh, to uh, submit, uh, to give me the chapter. Uh, so in, in, in the first chapter, uh, he offers a comparative study of the sense of exile and the initial shock of the different, the exotic in two Portuguese writers. Camilo Pesaña and Wenceslao de Moraes. The first, although, although uh, his book was published in 1920 and his verses circulated in manuscripts and other loose publications, is now considered among the great poets of the Portuguese language and has exercised a profound influence on literary modernists. The second was for many years the primary chronicle. I'm talking about, um, about the, uh, Wenceslao de Moraes. Uh, of the Orient in the, in the Portuguese language, writing for many newspapers and regularly publishing books on the subjects of China and Japan. Franchetti suggests that both of these uh, writers are important in the renewal of Portuguese literary thought. So it's a rereading of these classical, uh, classical I mean, uh, uh, writers. And then chapter two um, focuses on 
on the many interpolated stories in Joao Guimarães Rosa's, uh, pardon my Portuguese, <laughs> masterpiece, masterpiece Grand Gisectao Veredas, published in 1956. Hello, I know, it's always lovely to see you. <laughs> Um, the case of Maria Mutema has attracted, Maria Mutema is one of the interpolated stories in this great novel. Uh, so this theme has attracted a great deal of critical scholarship. Um, uh, uh, but according to uh, traditional criticism, Maria Mutema's case deals with the question of existence of absolute evil. However, in chapter two, uh, Giselda Galbao suggests a hermeneutic, hermeneutic uh, shift in the perspective of the Mutema case. The author suggests that Rosa's intentions for the story through the name Mutema, where the key term Mu from Zen, Zen Buddhism is added to the Portuguese word or theme of theme, Tema. Mu literally means emptiness, nothingness in Japanese, so the story of Mutema introduces the theme of emptiness that is enlightenment into the novel. So chapter three uh, makes a shift from, Latin from the Latin American gaze and takes us to Morocco. In this chapter, Kenneth Janis offers a unique study focusing chiefly on the collection of short stories by Mohamed Akalai Entre Tanger y Larache, which depicts the tensions that exist today within the hybrid language and space of a peripheral Moroccan culture embedded in the West. Akalai's work presents his audience with a dialogue that trips between the Orient and the Occident in which a Moroccan appropriates the Castilian language and his act does not come without its complications. Akalai's collection of short stories present a conflict of style between Moroccan costumbrista literature, which is didactic and moralizing, and um, with its roots in Arabic tra oral traditions. Um, and uh, I'm going to move on to the next chapter, and this is El Tiempo Entre Costuras, and the uh, author is going to be talking about this beautiful uh, novel, Spanish novel, that talks about the relationship uh, between uh, uh, Spain and also uh, uh, Northern Africa. And the uh, uh, last one, um, in chapter five, Catherine Mendes analyzes four novels by Mario Bellatin, but particularly she focuses on La Clase Muerta and Disecado, both published in 2011, as being works that explore the human body, its relationship with the presence of ghostly figures and both internal and external spaces. So, um, a beautiful chapter. Thank you, Catherine. And um, lastly, um, um, uh, uh, Jennifer Prince, who is here, she's going to talk about what he has, she has written about Verde Shanghai, this novel by uh, uh, the Mexican uh, novelist uh, Cristina Rivera Garza. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm very pleased to introduce two uh, of the contributors to the volume now. Um, our first uh, speaker among these two authors is going to be Cristina Vasquez Mauricio. She's a PhD student in the Hispanic and Usual Brazilian Languages and Literatures program at the Graduate Center. Um, she received her MA in Spanish Language and Linguistics from the University of Salamanca and her research focuses on post-dictatorship identity and historical memory in Spain and Portugal, Iberian nationalism, and Spanish-Portuguese relations. Her dissertation will focus on the negotiations of memory in the literature of Spain and Portugal after 1975. Please. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you to uh, Professor Dina Hero for um, putting this project together. Um, this was actually the first class that I took at the Graduate Center, and the irony is that I'm now in my last semester. I'm about to hand in my last paper on Monday. So uh, um, this is a full circle uh, project for me as well as for um, the contributors. So um, thank you uh, very much. Um, so I've uh, put together this um, prezi. The interesting thing about the book that I had, uh, El Tiempo Entre Costuras, is um, it's now a television series in Spain, um, and it's, and it's uh, filming for its second season right now. So 
Um, a lot of the images that we're going to see are actually from uh, the uh, television show. Um, in the 600 pages of El Tiempo Entre Costuras, uh, the colors, sounds, and textures and aromas of interwar Morocco are fused with the lives of the expatriates, um, both historical and fictional, of the uh, European-Arab relations within a unique Spanish context. The book is historically accurate and is just one of many examples of a rising interest to examine the unique relationship that existed between Spain and Morocco in the Protectorate from 1913 to 1958. Let's start here. So um, at first glance, the book um, seems to be a romanticized story of a young woman who leaves her home country of Spain just before the outbreak of the Civil War and travels with her lover to the exotic foreign land of Morocco. But a deeper reading reveals Um, a deeper reading reveals that the novel, and now the popular television series with the same name, illustrates one of the most foundational theories in post-colonial studies, which is Orientalism. So here we see the main character, Sita Quiroga, while she's in Madrid. This is right before the Civil War, 1934, 1935. And there she is with Ramiro in um, Tangier, um, a very a, a few years later, 1936, is when she when she moves to Morocco. So since publishing Orientalism in 1978, Edward Said has been considered the father of Orientalism um, as the academic and cultural movement that we know today. Um, I'm sure we are all familiar with it, however, in the text he postulates that for centuries there has been a subtle and persistent Eurocentric prejudice against Arab Islamic people and their culture that is derived from a long tradition of romanticized images of Asia and the Middle East. As Professor Tina Hanna said, however, there are very um, varying viewpoints um, about Orientalism, and there are many different types. So the Iberian Peninsula is different, however. Um, for almost 800 years, from 711 to 1492, the land that today is Spain and Portugal was ruled by several Arab caliphates. If Spain and Portugal are considered to be a part of Europe, then Said's theory is flawed. So we then go to the theory of Julia Kishigian and Professor Tina Hedo, whose theories diverge from Said to address the unique nature of the Hispanic world within this context. Professor Kishigian suggests that Spain is different because despite being a part of Europe, it was colonized before becoming a colonial superpower and therefore approaches its relationship with the Arab world in a different way. And in the same vein, Professor Tina Hedo states that a cultural product and its exchange between subjects on the periphery to others in the eyes of colonizing Europe, in this case Spain and Morocco, enable a better understanding of the self through an in-depth analysis of the product's presence. Uh, the Morocco Conference of 1912 declared the port city of Tangier an international zone that eventually became a travel destination for some of the most cosmopolitan families in Europe. And the rest of Morocco was divided between Spain and France. Um, so here we see some images of Tangier, the um, Hotel Continental around 1930. This is a, an actual photograph. And that is the way the Hotel Continental is uh, represented in episode three of the television show. And here is Avenida de España. It's one of the most, um, and is still, um, is still in Tangier today, um, a wide road with shops along the, along the Mediterranean, I'm sorry, along the Atlantic, um, Atlantic coast. Um, the Spanish zone, which um, was known as the Protectorate, was the more problematic of the two uh, regions because of the uninhabited rift mountains that are in the north of Africa. Sita, the narrator, tells us that in the face of the rich French, Spain was the poor kinsman. It was given the worst, most undesirable part of Morocco, the pork chop of Africa, as people would say. <laughs> Um, despite being only 14 kilometers apart, the average Spaniard living during Sita's time was unfamiliar with the protectorate and the Morocco that Sita becomes to know is much different from the Madrid she leaves behind. A strange yet brilliant city, the many people living in Tangiers coexist with each other, much like the smell of the spices coexist with the harshness of the consulate buildings. The Treaty of Algiers solidified Franco's hope that Spain would recognize a hereditary sanguine relationship with Morocco. And um, 
the, a historian named uh, Susan Martin Marquez, just like Professor Kishigian, recognizes that Spain's experience is different from the rest of Europe and argues that um, the policies of Francisco Franco position Spain as the benevolent colonizer of Morocco. So we see two very different um, historical theories happening during the time that this book is, um, is set. So the author, um, Maria Duenas, constructs an intricate, uh, an intricate work of historical fiction that focuses on the events prior to World War II and their relationship with the Spanish protectorate. Um, Cira Quiroga, as I said before, is a custom dressmaker from Madrid who leaves um, with her lover Ramiro to go to Tangier right before the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. When she finds out she's pregnant, he abandons her and they embark on a trip to, um, to Tangier and then she eventually wakes up and she is in, um, in Tetuan. And here we see her, I'm just going to forget these papers and I'll explain, the, uh, I'll explain the, the presentation. So here we see her working in the, um, in the dress shop that she comes to establish in Tangier to help her repay her debts. Um, that her lover leaves behind. And then she comes to live in the home of, of a woman who helps people that are in transit. And one of her first jobs is to um, smuggle guns from her home to this, other, um, to this other home. And she does so by strapping them onto her body and covering herself with a hake. And um, professor, one of the uh, main theories that I that I analyze in my, in my chapter is that the hake, although it separates her from the rest of the women, it actually means that underneath the hake, the Moroccan women and the Spanish women are basically, um, are basically the same. So then she travels to Madrid, but when she goes back to Madrid, she assumes the position of a Moroccan seamstress. So she doesn't go back to Madrid as um, a Spanish woman, she goes back as a Moroccan woman, and now we're in Madrid in 1940, 1941, where Hitler and the Germans are trying to get Spain on board with World War II. And she changes her name. So if you look at um, her name, it's actually Cira Quiroga spelled backwards. And when she goes, yeah, very, very interesting. <laughs> so when she goes back to Madrid, she assumes the role of a Moroccan woman, and we see her here um, with um, wearing a Traditional. Um, I'm sorry, Christina, but it's burning me. What happened to the baby? Because this guy, you know, that baby must have been. Oh, okay. she actually has a miscarriage on a bus, and then oh. she falls unconscious, and then when she wakes up, she's um, handcuffed to a hospital bed in, in the Spanish protectorate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are very um, abrupt breaks in the uh, in the narration, and one of them is when we meet Arish Agoriuk, and she becomes a seamstress, much as she is um, in the Protectorate now in Madrid. She's a seamstress, but she needs the help of these German twins to help um, interpret what is happening. Oh, mm -hmm. just try to wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. Um, she needs the help of these German girls to help interpret what's happening. And the whole point of establishing the, the shop in Madrid is she needs to know what the Nazis are doing, what events are happening, who's going to be there, and why. And she then takes the notes that the German girls are writing down and in Morse code puts them into sewing patterns so that she can send them to the British that she's working for and then they can figure out what to do. Um, and as we know from history, Spain does not have an active role in, in World War II. And this is just an image of how they portray the Nazi, um, Nazi soldiers. And this is her shop in Madrid. So she's appropriated these Moroccan, Moroccan yeah. products and architecture um, to give her shop the appearance of being Moroccan. But in reality, she is actually a Spanish woman. So we, we see how they how they um, negotiate the, the two different identities. And then this is just an example of another TV show. It's not based on a book, but um, that was very popular several years ago that has to do with, with Spain and the Protectorate and basically the same story. Um, fascist soldier, young girl, and Arab um, Muslim attendant. And I mean, it's super interesting. You can watch it, it's very good. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you have questions, you can wait until until the end. But Sorry. thank you. I'm just subscribe. No, it's fine. Awesome. It's fine. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Esther. I think you correctly announced we have uh, time for discussion, so whatever you didn't have a chance to present, you can always return to this if there are questions. Let me uh, introduce our second contributor to the book today. Uh, Jennifer Prince is uh, also a doctoral student in the Hispanic and Luso-Brazilian Literatures and Languages program. Don't you have an abbreviation? <laughs> I mean, this is just impossible. Um, we love it. It's, uh, uh, OK. And the way <laughs> The Women's, the women's uh, study Certificate Program at the Graduate Center. Um, she specializes in 20th and 21st century novels and women writers. Her current studies center on women writing uh, the Spanish Civil War with a transatlantic focus that includes the texts of American writers and nurses present in Spain during the war, as well as the inscription of women into the conflict through the novels of contemporary female Spanish novelists. What a sentence. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we're looking so forward helpful. to our presentation. Um, obviously, the, the chapter that I'm presenting today has nothing to do, or has somewhat um, something to do with what I study overall. Um, but now we are located on a completely different continent and in a very different context. Um, first of all, before I begin, I'd like to say thank you to Professor Pinaquero for your relentless work and um, expert guidance through the project. <laughs> she didn't give up on us. It took um, a lot of uh, effort and strength, and I, I thank you. Um, also, I, I do want to say that this book that I'm presenting today is probably the most complex book I've ever read as far as just getting through the text. Mm -hmm. So I'm presenting you with uh, several quotes today on the screen that will maybe help us work through one of the major issues, which is the yotro, uh, which is not a typo, it is now a word. Um, so we're dealing with the issue of Orientalisms as a dialogue between the East and the West, in this case between a, a Mexican woman living in Mexico City and an alter ego, another woman um, who is Chinese, who is also living in the same area. Um, I first read this book a couple years ago in Professor Tinajero's class, and I've read it a couple more times and since then, and it seems every time like I read it, it's a completely different book. It's based on a series of short stories that Cristina Rivera Garza actually wrote 20 years ago, and um, she kind of interwove the stories in this novel with a narrative thread to connect them, but you still kind of feel this distinctness of the, the various events. Um, the incredibly complex stories occur simultaneously, or maybe circularly, um, definitely not chronologically. And so naturally it's a little bit difficult to talk about, so I'm gonna give you just the basic plot, and then we'll talk about the idea of the yoke, which is completely fascinating to me. Um, in Verde Shanghai, the novel's protagonist is Maria, Marina Espinosa. She's a woman living an uninteresting yet comfortable life, married to a wealthy doctor, Horacio Quiro, um, Olvido Chea. Um, after a car accident that leaves her with a broken arm, she's haunted by the image of another woman whose name she knows, it's Xiang, um, but her identity remains a mystery. Marina believes that knowing Xiang will help her understand more about her own identity. So she leaves her home and her husband and begins to search the neighborhood where she knows Xiang lives, the barrio chino of the capital. And in doing this, she leaves behind her previous life and also recuperates memories as well as her own voice uh, in an exchange of writings with an interlocutor who is neither Horacio nor Xiang. His name is Xiang Wei. Um, Xi'an is also the protagonist of her own set of stories, and for various reasons, the reader throughout the text could be thinking that Marina and Xi'an are actually the same person. Um, so when the two women finally meet, it's unexpected and interesting. Um, so not long after I finished writing this chapter, I was walking through the East Village, and I saw this quote, um, Ubuntu, the English translation is, I am because you are. And it has a very kind of humanist um, philosophy, a way of situating the individual within a greater society. Um, but it was kind of this aha moment for me 
I am because you are taken literally. So what if Xi'an and Marina only exist because the other person exists literally? Borges. Um, yes, yeah, yes, very, uh, and I, I do write about Borges in this chapter as well. Um, so if they can only exist because the other person exists, literally exists, um, then it kind of creates this paradoxical or circular um, way of generating a person's existence. Um, in Verde Shanghai, Marina and her interlocutor Chiang Wei establish a term for this combination of I and other, and it is the yotra. Um, from the, the text itself, uh, Xiang says to her, no eres tu, Marina. And she begins to kind of question this, her interlocutor's originality, his uh, way of thinking, because she um, necesitaba alguien con más imaginación, alguien para ser, uh, para quien ser y no ser no fueran puntos opuestos en una línea recta, alguien que pudiera concebir la, la peculiar realidad de la ficción, sus propias reglas. <laughs> so we're establishing rules outside of the linear chronologic, um, chronology and as well um, about who a person can actually be. So she thinks more about this idea and she, and pardon my French because that's not my program, uh, she responds, just un autre. Je et un autre. Gracias. <laughs> Merci. Uh, yes. um, that's my French. I am another. And they come up with the idea of yotro, the combination of yo and otro in one. So we have this idea of a search for an identity that is not just who am I, but is also who is the other. And you get this circular idea of identity, but you also get the circular temporality. So you have to also take into consideration who was I and who am I going to be. And um, to that effect, we have a scene, two scenes in the novel, one occurs when Marina, at the very beginning of the book, she's beginning to kind of recover some of her memories. And she remembers a time when she is in a bar. Um, and she's baptized. Marina is baptized with the name Xiang. Um, the woman who baptizes her is wearing a flowered skirt. She seems to know her. She invites her to have a drink. And the bartender's name is Mauricio. 200 pages later in the book, separately, Xi'an's present timeline, she goes into a bar. She meets a woman in a flowered skirt. She introduces herself, and they're given drinks by a bartender named Mauricio. And Xi'an experiences deja vu. Her companion, the woman in the flowered skirt, seems unaware, um, or seems aware of this temporality and completely unaffected by it. Um, and she says to her, Ya habías estado aquí, ¿verdad? You've already been here, right? La mujer hacía como se preguntaba, uh, como que preguntaba, pero en realidad lo afirmaba. No esperaba ninguna respuesta. She said it like she was asking, but in reality, she was just confirming it. Um, so the positive reality here, or realities, is one in which Xi'an's present can have an impact on Marina's past, um, but also one in which both women are the same woman. Um, both Marina and Xi'an at separate times throughout the novel declare and confirm their own existence, but they are skeptical about the existence of the other. The two women separately ponder reasons for the other's presence in their lives. Is it insanity, a dream, an invention, a memory? However, they cannot give a reasonable explanation for why the other is as undoubtedly real as they are themselves, especially when they meet. Xi'an's most complete explanation of this phenomenon is that recordar es un asunto complicado. Los recuerdos cobran vida por sí mismos y sin parpadear, sin preocuparse por aquellos que los generaron, adquieren piernas, manos, caras, 
So the dream or the memory is taking its own form, its own life um, that is like carne y hueso. Um, so these are some of the um, very interesting and intriguing ideas that I examine in the chapter. Um, we do kind of at the very end go back to um, the Orientalism idea in the way that Edward Said describes it. Um, Marina, who's been living this very freeing um, and intriguing existence as a Yotro, is kidnapped by her husband, who believes that she is ill. And he brings her back home. He's a doctor. And he wants to treat her medically. So you get this kind of, at the very last moment, um, the Western um, medicine science that kind of overpowers this um, dialogue um, and kind of subversion of identity and search for identity. I'm about out of time. That's <laughs> great. Um, so I do encourage you. Pick it up. Pick up my book. <laughs> and um, you will enjoy it. Thanks. Um, I won't have a presentation here. I'm sure you'll have lots of questions for the two contributors here in particular, but um, I would just like to offer a few comments and thoughts um, from the point of view of somebody who, well, as I've said, is an Orientalist. Um, I think if we approach this material from a Middle Eastern angle, uh, many things present themselves slightly differently. So, um, the legacy of Said's Orientalism presents a paradox. Among academics who study the Orient professionally, uh, languages, history, culture, so one of Said's major targets, the book had almost no real impact if we measure impact by change in scholarship. Much of the critique in the book, concerned with the relationship between power and knowledge, stereotyping and polemicizing, has been expressed by others and much earlier than 1978. We did not need Edward Said in order to wake up. Much of the book's account of Oriental studies was also perceived as misrepresenting the tradition by focusing on the racist margins of the field or by focusing on those who did not have any academic credentials. So when many of us who study um, Oriental languages, history, culture professionally, when many of us refer to the significance of the concept of Orientalism, what we usually do is we reflect its popularity in post-colonial studies, where it has come to denote a much more general mechanism of constructing the, the non-Western, the non-white mm. other. So in my comments, I would like to return to Said's understanding of Orientalism and offer a few observations concerning the relevance of the Hispanic and Luso-Brazilian world in this context. There is a serious flaw in Oriental studies in the sense that we never look to the other side of the Atlantic, whether it's the northern part of the Americas or the southern part. So I think this, this uh, enterprise to bring Orientalism and uh, Hispanic, Luso-Brazilian studies uh, yet, as yet unabbreviated together is a very challenging and interesting project here. So um, Edward Said distinguished three different kinds of Orientalism, the first one being academic Orientalism. Beginning with uh, Pascual de Gallangos in the 19th century, Spain has a long and rich uh, tradition of scholarly engagement with Arabic and Islam. This tradition does not seem to fit into the pattern described by Said. Rather than studying the colonial other, uh, Morocco is probably an exception here, Spanish Orientalists frequently studied their own past. Gallangos was somebody who explored the archives, the manuscript collections in Spain. That's what we are very grateful for. In the area after Franco, regional studies flourished in Spain and Andalusi history was part of that. Accordingly, um, one can also see that among the Oriental or Islamic languages studied in Spain, Arabic really has the pride of place. Um, Persian is not studied, Turkish is not studied, and the Spanish Orientalists are starting to complain because they need people who work on something else than uh, Al-Andalus. Um, but what exactly was the significance of Al-Andalus for Spain's historically formed identity? 
Two proposed views are emblematically represented by Américo Castro and so, uh, Claudio Sánchez Albornoz. We don't speak about these two scholars exclusively, but as I've said, emblematically. While the latter, so uh, Claudio Sánchez Albornoz, defended a theory of continuous Spanish identity from ancient times onwards, the former argued that Islamic and Jewish cultures had a profound impact on Spain, and it was this position which won out. The authors and the debate also had a South American background. So Castro was born in Brazil and uh, Albornoz went to Buenos Aires into exile. The debate itself has been understood as a response to the end of Spain's colonial age. The, col the colonies were lost, so people turned to Spain itself, one is Spanish identity. When it comes to academic Orientalism, however, Oriental studies um, are not well represented in Central and South America. There are exceptions, of course. I'm thinking of Alberto Musa, who is a Brazilian author and he's also a linguist. But um, if you look at these international conferences of Oriental <coughs> studies, there ha there's hardly anybody from uh, the southern part of the Americas there, which is not surprising because that's not a good way of making money studying Arabic. Um, people are too smart for that. Um, so the second kind of Orientalism operates with an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient and the Occident. Critics have accused sight of working with precisely such binaries, so the orientalizing West is always opposed to the orientalized East. But does, uh, does, that does not render moot the analytical exercise of identifying discursive binaries. So a question um, that I have actually for the editor and the contributors here is, does literature from the Hispanic and Luso-Brazilian world construct binaries and what exactly is their nature? So to prepare for this event, I started to read uh, Leonardo Padura's La Cola de la Serpiente, um, which was entertaining, um, in the novel, which is a mystery novel. The detective Mario Conde solves a crime in the Chinese quarter of Havana. The author operates, the author that is Padura, operates with clear binaries between Conde's world and that of the Chinese Cubans, who cannot even pronounce Spanish properly, or who decide they don't want to pronounce Spanish properly. When I read this, I was actually, <laughs> I was pleased to read this because uh, just as the Chinese in Cuba can't pronounce the R, I also can't pronounce the R. Um, <laughs> so I was, I was glad to read but this. They, but they pronounce it. Huh? Sorry. But they pronounce it. They pronounce it. Why... Well, in the, so in the novel, uh, the detective uh, kind of teases the father of his colleague who is Chinese Cuban, and he says, "Why can't you pronounce the R properly?" He gives him all sorts of words with lots of R's. So how do you pronounce it? How do you pronounce it? They did the same with me when they teased me for my German accent. And at some point, but what was interesting actually was that in Central America, they always told me, well, the Cubans, the Cubans, they also don't pronounce the R. The Cubans, they said, oh, vamos a comer. They always say, mm. So I thought it was so funny to read this uh, Cuban novel about the Chinese Cubans and the, the Cuban uh, kind of detective teasing the Chinese with the same uh, kind of linguistic flaw. I thought I should present myself as having a Cuban accent, but you can tell why this will not work. <laughs> so, so Chinese in Cuba have uh, their own space, their own networks, their own conventions, their own food, and their own religion. Um, so uh, make curious case of the San Fan Con, um, a, a, a general from China who becomes a saint. But is this difference here indicative of a binary between East and West in the novel and also in other literary examples? There are reasons to assume that the difference between Westerner and Easterner in the Western Hemisphere was in certain, in certain contexts less sharp than in Europe. So in Europe, when we speak about East and West to a large extent, what we have in mind is Christian Europe versus the Islamic Middle East. Um, the vast majority of Middle Eastern immigrants to the Americas, however, were Christians and they had also been educated in French schools. So when they came to the Americas, to the South, um, the large gap uh, of religion was just not there. Um, does that mean they fit into the same category of the Chinese? I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, one can also ask uh, about the place of the Yoruba deities of the Santeria in this context. So if they are the object of orientalizing, what is the effect on the constructed Orient? 
The imaginary oriental bracket for the Middle East and China is difficult enough to define, but adding West Africa into that bracket makes that task even more complicated. So if we understand Orientalism as operating with an opposition between the white normative and the non-white other, it's probably easy to identify such binaries in literature from the Hispanic and Luso-Brazilian world. But to frame this, and this is my point here, to frame this as East and West suggests geographical, cultural, and political continuities which don't have an historical foundation. And this brings me to my third kind, uh, Edward Said's third kind of Orientalism here. According to Said, the first and second kinds of Orientalism are historically and materially uh, located in the British and French colonial enterprise. Mm -hmm. Critics have often pointed out that a lot of scholarship was produced outside of this environment, notably by Germans. They used to say German is the most important Oriental language because so much of the scholarship was written in German. Um, but Spain also does not seem to fit into this picture, although one can make an argument that it did. So when Muslim troops, mostly Berbers, under Arab leadership, invaded the Iberian Peninsula in 711, Spain did not exist. Sanchez Albornoz drew a line from the Visigoths to the Reconquistadores, but this continuity existed more in the rhetorical realm than in reality. Al-Andalus may have been in a marginal position in the Muslim world, but it was not a colony, neither politically nor culturally. For about 30 years after the conquest, Al-Andalus was uh, subject to the Umayyad caliphs with their capital in Damascus, but when the Abbasids toppled the Umayyads in the 740s, Al-Andalus became independent. And I think it's really important to have a look at those maps because, um, um, because uh, they tell us something about the position of Al-Andalus in that Muslim world. They tell us something about the relationship between Al-Andalus and Iraq, Al-Andalus and Syria, Al-Andalus and Yemen, and so on. So I'm not just saying this as a medievalist, <laughs> really important. But it's also important to have a close look. So Andalusi Muslims were Muslims like anybody else. They partook in Islamic learning, political language, religious tradition, and they also spoke Arabic. We don't have any evidence that the presence of Christians and Jews among Andalusi Muslims made Andalusi suspicious in the eyes of their fellow believers. Just like anti-Spanish propaganda produced in England, for example, used the presence of Jews and of Muslims in order to depict the enemy in a negative light, but the same did not happen in the Islamic world. Um, in the Islamic world, religious diversity was the rule rather than the exception. Um, what did distinguish Al-Andalus from other parts of the early Muslim conquests was only that it did not remain under Muslim rule. So if one wanted to make a case for Spanish colonialism on the Iberian Peninsula itself, I think that Sanchez Albornoz's suspicion would be good evidence. So the Reconquistadores of the 11th century and onwards would be unmasked as conquistadores, legitimizing their military conquests with the historical narrative that, construct, that constructs continuity of ownership and of identity. If we follow Américo Castro, his, uh, Spain's historical legacy is hybridity, and the same is true for the Hispanic and Luso-Brazilian world in general. So um, my second question for you would be, how do we reconcile the two analytical paradigms? Orientalism, which operates with binaries, and the hybridity as the result of the exercise of identifying and deconstructing Orientalist mechanisms. Um, it's a little bit of a mystery to me how that works, but I think it just works in kind of dialogue um, and continuous analysis. This, uh, by way of comments, and thank I you. Think we can thank you. I've been trying to answer your questions for thirty years now. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, yes, uh, I, I have always argued that there are no binary oppositions when it comes to uh, uh, the relationship of Latin America and uh, and uh, and the Far East, which is the part that I have studied the most. Um, in the case of Spain, yes, it becomes a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that uh, uh, literature itself gives us the answer because one of the authors, uh, Mohammed Al-Khalai, he's talking about like terrorism and how um, 
uh, in one of his short stories and how uh, terrorism is looked at post 9-11, mm -hmm. terrorism is looked from the Arabic world. How, you know, how, uh, uh, how they are afraid, uh, the Arabs themselves, to look like, uh, you know, to look like terrorists and this constant uh, uh, fear that they have, no? So it, it shows us the other side of the coin, but it's showing us in Spanish. So we, here we have a Moroccan talking about the Arab world, but in Spanish, no? Mm -hmm. So I think it's wonderful. I mean, to study it, I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. just, so literature, I think, that give us the answer, so. Um, Yes, but I mean, would that be an example of Orientalism for you, or how would you use the term Orientalism uh, kind of productively uh, for a text like that? Yeah, no, in that case, it's uh, a hy uh, hybridity. Mm. Yeah, it's hybridity, and um, it's because of the presence of Spain in in, in Morocco or northern uh, Africa. It's, it's because of its presence and because of the because Spain was there, and also the Arabs were were in in Spain because of that contact that we have. This, many years. Yes, many years. That's why we have these. Uh, uh, how do you call it? These echoes, no, of that relationship, mm -hmm. huh? and uh, it, it's orientalism. It's, it's a self-orientalism, mm -hmm. right? Because he's talking. His characters are uh, from uh, from Morocco. Huh? So had not had Spain not been there, or had you know, if there had not been contact, then maybe we could look at it differently. But uh, the fact that his characters are uh, and they are back and forth, they are uh, the characters are uh, back and forth from Morocco to France, from Morocco to Spain. Mm -hmm. So that that's it's just almost more an exercise in undermining Orientalism than affirming it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Um, it, yeah, I don't. Um, as far as Verde Shanghai goes, you do kind of see some binary um, type structures, especially between Marina and her husband Horacio, when she starts to kind of like orientalize herself by going into the barrio chino, and he kind of feels the need to. Um, to save her, to pull her back and say, you're not being logical, you're not doing what's right, mm -hmm. this, is, this is wrong, and as the doctor, I'm going to study you and I'm going to fix you. Um, so you get this kind of real binary relationship through them and also through um, Jiang Wei, um, his father came from China to Mexico and um, Jiang is presenting his, um, I'm sorry, his grandfather, is presenting his grandfather's story and also historical documents, uh, which are real historical documents in, inserted into the novel about the the treatment of the Chinese immigrants upon arriving at the beginning of the 19th, or the twentieth century. Um, but for the most part, um, I think that the that the book is best represented by a circle. Um, mm -hmm where every point is going to lead you to a different point on the circle. And there's this sort of communication um, that can be done uh, among all of the, the different characters. And um, the circles may not be perfectly overlaid. They kind of overlap. Um, and it's, uh, it just creates a, a really interesting, like you said, mm -hmm. uh, hybridity um, that kind of undermines mm -hmm. or subverts the, the more traditional um, east versus west mm -hmm. paradigm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me given your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, in talking about um, this book, one of the um, one of the main examples is the use of language. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, through the images, we can see that when Sita leaves Madrid and she goes to um, and she goes to Tangier. When she's first there, it's an international community. She can speak Spanish. She meets people that speak English. She meets people that speak French. And then after her lover leaves her and she loses her child and she wakes up in, in Tetuan in the, um, in the Spanish protectorate, she continues to speak Spanish. Now it's, it's assumed that, oh, you're white. You are a Spanish person that just so happens to live here. 
And then when she's asked to become a, a British spy and work for the work for the British government, when she needs to go back to Madrid, which is her homeland, she is able to speak Spanish, but to her clients, she has to speak German. And they allow her to become incorporated into this elite society because she's so different. And being so different when on the inside she's actually mm -hmm. Spanish, um, because she's so different, no one really asks any questions because, oh, she's exotic, she's making dresses for us, this is very exciting, sure, and they just accept it. But in order for her to do her job, she can't even speak the language that is spoken in that country. She needs help so that she can... So, so they're constant um, coming and going between the two identities. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there's... Um, Later on, in the beginning of the book, there is a sense of the other. Sita doesn't know anything about Morocco. She just assumes, oh, los moros, and they're there, and yeah, exactly. they're across the street. We're, four, we're nine miles away, but they're very different, sure. Um, there, there is a sense of that, but then she comes to comes into contact with, with them, and, and she does have an appreciation for them, so much so that she appropriates this identity and then goes back to Spain, and it's accepted um, it's accepted there as well. So in the beginning, yes, but as the as the story goes on, um, no. So you have um, two potential orientalizers. One seems to be something like a converted orientalizer who <laughs> goes native in the uh, uh, old manner of speaking. The other potential orientalizer would be the author of the book. How is how does how is the portrayal of Morocco done? Do you think the author of the book might be an orientalizer or? She well. What's funny about Maria Duenas is that she's um, she's from Spain. She's actually an English professor. Um, she's a she's a scholar of English, and um, and and she she wrote this book. It's actually her first book, and now she's writing another one. It's not a follow up or anything, but it, it's also in Spanish. Um, I found her narration to be to be very benevolent and also historically accurate. Mm -hmm. However, in so doing she, through the characters, shows that they feel that the Orient or the Arab world is different. Mm -hmm. So she's accurately portraying what Morocco looks like through, image, through an image that obviously a reader would construct in their mind and later on in the television show, but through her characters she shows what a average everyday Spaniard thought of what was going on, uh, going on in Morocco, because very few people had had contact with, with what was going on there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. First of all, um, let me clarify that this is not my speciality. <laughs> that I am just the publisher. Okay? And, 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 and to that capacity, I have to speak. But uh, what I, what I have to say is uh, from uh, that, and I congratulate the two of you for those wonderful presentations. Uh, um, that. Uh, gives me the sense that I was right when I made the decision to go for the book. Um, and you have great careers coming your way. And you know that. Uh, you should know that. Um, but uh, um, that being said, from a theoretical perspective, and this is, my, this is my position, you cannot trace limits to identity. So the, the um, idea of discussing whether it is binary or it, of the, the concept of hybridity or the, of the hybrid, it's, it's an attempt to understand uh, the, um, um, the evolution of the subject that represents, uh, that is represented in, this, in, this, uh, in these works. Um, however, um, there are, I, I would say that there are the even larger uh, considerations. Why did we take the concept, the concept of the yotro to the philosophy and we make it a theoretical approach? What if we embrace that idea that I is the other, and that we exist because the other exists, and that we sustain each other by existing, by being? In that sense, uh, the orientalizer, it's a, it's a modern concept. It's, it's someone who makes a decision, a voluntary decision, to transform reality by orientalizing it. That, that the, the Soviet as, it, as itself has a history. However, however, reality goes beyond the, the intention of the Soviet. So uh, I would uh, argue in favor of developing this concept beyond the characters and take it as a theoretical approach to interpret the, in, in the works. Now, if we go to the idea of uh, the other, which is what, what, what is behind this, you know, I or the other or the other and uh, they and us, 
Uh, what about poetry, music, mythology? We, we, all, we, all, we all know Greek mythology. Regardless of the language you speak, we all, are we all uh, Greek? Are we all uh, um, Italian? Are we, the, in the fact that I, I come from a Quechua speaking language, country, for example, uh, what I am trying to say is that you cannot define the other, you cannot trace the limit. And it's, it's, a, it's a trick, and a, as, a, as a scholars, we shouldn't fall for that trick. We have to understand that the Soviet is more fluid than the taxonomy of identity. That the, tax, the, the, the need for a, taxonomy of, of, for a taxonomy of the Soviet is a need that was developed pretty recently in history. If you go to, to Don Quixote, you notice that at the, in Don Quixote, at the very beginning, it's, it's, it's at, the, at the very center of the transformation when they are trying to decide, to decide who is us and who are they. But in reality, that's a modern concept. Nature is not that. The, there is no need for us to trace a taxonomy of the Soviet of the identity. For that is a trick of...